All right, so this week's lab, we will be preparing one for diphenyl, one three butadiene, and it looks like this. Uh, specifically, we will form the uh, trans trans one four diphenyl one three butadiene. Okay, and the way we're going to do this is by doing what's called the Wittig reaction. So it's German, so that W is a V sound, but you might hear it as a Wittig reaction, but I'll call it the Wittig reaction, um, just because that's how I was taught. So um, this, the way we're going to do that is using cinnamaldehyde, and this is cinnamaldehyde right here. You can kind of already see where this is going with the that benzene ring with the pi bond, right? You can kind of pick that out of the product, right? Um, and then we will combine it with uh, benzyl phosphonium uh, chloride. Okay, so uh, it's basically got a phosphorus atom bound to that benzyl position and three phenyl groups, right? So remember that pH is short for phenyl, which is that benzene ring. Okay, and uh, it's got a positive charge because it's got four bonds to it and it's in the same uh, group as nitrogen, so it's only supposed to have three in a lone pair. Um, but uh, it's also phosphorus, so it's it's can have that expanded octet. So, um, and then its counter anion is chloride. That's why it's called benzyl phosphonium, or be, sorry, benzyl triphenylphosphonium chloride, right? And then uh, when we combine these two guys together in the presence of a base, um, it that's basically the makings of the Wittig reaction. And um, in this case, our our base is going to be sodium ethoxide, uh, which I'll show you how to make in the video. Um, typically, what you, if you were in the lab, you would just come in and this would already be made. Um, it's it's actually pretty fun to do, um, but we, it's done with elemental sodium, and so you guys wouldn't get to touch that. But uh, ethanol is going to be our solvent, and then that will give us our product. Um, <clears throat> take a look at these benzylic protons right here. Those are very acidic, especially being a benzylic position, but also next to that phosphorus that's positively charged. Uh, the ensuing conjugate base is actually it's resonance stabilized, and so sodium ethoxide is sufficient enough to remove that proton at the benzylic position. Okay, now that base is usually something called butyl lithium. Um, and it's much stronger, but in this case, it's perfect for us because we don't want to work with butyl lithium because it's pyrophoric. All right, so how do we make that benzyl triphenyl phosphonium chloride would be the question. So we can make, you start with benzyl chloride. Remember, lacrimators, um, that's, benzyl chloride is a lacrimator, so we obviously want to be using this um, these compounds in the hood because they cause irritation to the eye. Okay, they cause tear, uh, tears, right? That's where the word lacrimator came from. And so what we do is combine the, in general, an, a Wittig reaction is the combination of an alkyl chloride with triphenylphosphine, okay? Now remember, uh, triphenylphosphine, sorry, let me just write this out for you. Uh, don't forget all of those pHs are benzene rings, um, but it's just so much easier to do this, right? Um, that phosphorus is in the same group as nitrogen, right? And so it's going to act just like nitrogen in that it likes to have three bonds and a lone pair, but it can attack things, right? And with that lone pair, it is nucleophilic. And so that's exactly what it does. It does an SN2 reaction, right? And then it kicks out that chlorine and you end up with the desired benzyl triphenyl phosphonium chloride. Okay, got that positive charge on the phosphine, and then uh, the chloride is now the uh, counter anion. It's the, it's balancing out the positive charge on that phosphorus. Okay, I'm just gonna copy and paste this under here so I don't have to redraw that out. Takes forever. Okay, so this guy right here again is called the Wittig salt. It's a salt because it's got a positive and negative charge, right? It's to, uh, and um, Wittig salt is because we're using it for the uh, Wittig reaction. Now, the next step in this would be deprotonation, right, to form that anionic compound 
the conjugate base. So removal of that blue, one of those blue protons, it can be done with a base uh, very easily. Just throw that in there, remove the, the those electrons can create the pi bond between the carbon and phosphorus. But actually what I want to do is make those go on the carbon. That way we can kind of see more, it's more obvious at least with the where the nucleophilic site is. And now we know what's going to be doing the attacking, right? Because this is our nucleophile in this Wittig reaction. All right, so this is uh, essentially one of our intermediate. This is why we need the sodium ethoxide to be present. And we do not want water present because water would strip, just easily protonate that and then kind of just ruin our day, right? Um, and then this illid right here is a yellow color. So this is why we want the yellow color to persist after the addition of the sodium ethoxide okay now again that base could be butyl lithium b-u-l-i or it could be ethoxide in this case right so um it just depends on the acidity of the proton um, for your vitic salt which and if you can use a base that's not super pyrophoric and blows out of your uh, syringe like a flamethrower then yeah do that um, the byproduct is going to be sodium chloride, right? So sodium come, the cation comes from the ethoxide and the chloride from the Wittig salt. And that we can just rinse away at the end of the reaction with a little bit of water, right? Because we know that sodium chloride is soluble in water. Turns out our product is not soluble in water. So that works out great. Okay. Now, this anionic compound right here, notice we have a negative charge next to a positive charge. That by definition is called an illid okay and um this particular illid is, this is kind of i mean other illids do exist but when we talk about illids illids you want to really think vitig reaction okay so um it's super this is the intermediate that forms in situ and it acts as our nucleophile to attack the uh carbonyl compound right um so just to show you the resonance structure, this is actually the neutral compound that would form if you create that phosphorus carbon uh, pi bond. And it is neutral, so obviously that would be like the way you might draw it. But I like to think of draw the structure like this, where you have the negative charge. So that way it's obvious, like where's the nucleophilic carbon? What's doing the attacking, right? And I do want to point out also that this is our starting compound, okay? So, um, sorry, I just sneezed and now I'm all congested. So, um, but the illid is made what's called in situ, right? And so that's basically saying that we, we form this in the reaction flask and we don't isolate it, okay? It's made in situ and then it just reacts with our cinnamaldehyde in this case okay so again i like to just show the illid like this so that way it's very obvious what the negative or what the nucleophilic site is right because that nucleophilic site does the attacking on the electrophilic site and it does it on the cinnamaldehyde so that cinnamaldehyde right here, I'm going to go ahead and abbreviate it. I just want to throw in a carbonyl compound to, to react with this illid, okay? And so I'll draw the rest of that cinnamaldehyde with an, as it indicated with an R group, okay? Because I'm not about to draw all that. That's too much, okay? Just so you know, phosphorus and oxygen love each other, okay? Phosphonium oxides are super common and they have a strong affinity for one another, phosphorus and oxygen. So that red electrons, those are the, that's the anionic site, right? The nucleophilic site. Phosphorus is positively charged and so it's down to accept electrons. Um, of course, that carbonyl compound it has that carbon that's susceptible to nucleophilic attack by the illid. And at the same time, this is a concerted mechanism where we'll have, well, I'm drawing it as a concerted mechanism where we'll have uh, that oxygen, pi, carbon oxygen pi bond directly attack that phosphorus. And so what we end up with is this cool um, intermediate where we have a four membered ring as drawn here. So that our group bada bing bada boom okay and so 
this guy right here is an intermediate, of course, it's a form of ring, highly strained, um, and it is called an oxophosphatane. Okay, so I put the brackets around just to indicate that it is an intermediate. I don't always do that for you guys, but um, th yeah, this is clearly a very uh, unstable compound. And what it does is it undergoes a rearrangement. So you're shifting electrons around. If you think about what's happening to those electrons, we're breaking a carbon oxygen bond and we're breaking a carbon phosphorus bond. So what you end up with is two completely separate compounds, okay? So let me try and draw this guy out for you. What we got here is a, uh, that benzene ring now has a pi bond with the hydrogen and an R group on there. <clears throat> okay. And then we also have the phosphorus with that double bond to the oxygen and three phenyl groups. Okay. So uh, this guy right here, the R group, that is representing, remember, that was just the rest of that cinnamaldehyde, right? So that's the, let me draw this compound out for you first. So cinnamaldehyde, it's got that portion with the, the carbonyl group on the end, okay? So the aldehyde portion. But if we just box this little portion right here, that's the R group, okay? And so there's our other pi bond and there's our other benzene ring. So there you go. That was the, that's the product right there, right? So let's see if we can draw this out and not have it look too terrible. Uh, right, so benzene ring. All right, so pi bond, pi bond. Notice these two pi bonds, they are technically trans and trans, right? And so this is the desired product, okay? So this is the solid material that will filter off in the end of the reaction, okay? This is triphenylphosphine, this, uh, I'm sorry, triphenylphosphine oxide, and this is, as like triphenylphosphine oxide and triphenylphosphine, we don't want to breathe in, they're toxic, and so don't mess around with that. But um, it's, it's not going to be, there's not a significant amount forming in this particular reaction because we don't really have too much, but there's also, uh, it's in solution, so we don't have to worry too much. We just got to be aware and be careful, right? So we also form the cis trans isomer, right? And so look at this guy right here. So remember that the carbonyl group is trigonal planar, right? And so nucleophilic attack can occur from the top or the bottom. And your inter your oxophosphatane intermediate can be arranged in any way, right? And so that's why you get your cis trans isomer, okay, as well. So what happens is this cis trans isomer will filter it's it's it reacts with light and it isomerizes to the trans trans isomer okay so remember cis trans and trans trans those are diastereomers of one another right and so what do we know about diastereomers physical properties they're different even though they look the same right the same bond connectivity so that cis trans isomer is actually going to be a liquid at room temperature because it's boiling melting point and boiling point are different and so we can filter that off with uh, the triphenylphosphine oxide and analyze that with TLC like we do our product okay so let's take a look at how we oh not that guy so this right here so remember I said this was an SN2 reaction right and so I really kind of want to just give you couple, like some of the limitations of the Vitic reaction right so since that is a uh, an SN2 reaction the the rate of the reaction is actually going to increase as you go from um, like a tertiary to a secondary to a primary to uh, a methyl, right? Sorry, I said tertiary, but we know we can't do SN2 with that. Um, but that means that we prefer to have a primary alkyl halide in this particular reaction to form that Vitic salt, okay? We also uh, should know that it's regioselective. And so let me just give you an example of that. Um, let's say we have this alcohol right here and we throw in some acid, right? We get the elimination. I don't know why I did that. Um, and then you get your alkene here, right? What if that was the desired one? Perfect, we formed it. But unfortunately, what we're also gonna do is form this tri-substituted alkene, which is in fact the major product, right? Because it's tri-substituted over the di-substituted compound up above, okay? So 
we're going to get a mixture, and unfortunately, we're only going to get a minor amount of the desired product. But with the Vidig, it's kind of baller because you're always going to get that pie bond where you want it, okay? And you just got to make it work. Um, and then, of course, your primary alkyl halide is going to be the best option. So when you're making a, a Vidig compound or a compound using the Vidig reaction, you want to make sure that you choose the correct pathway. And that would be ideally priming the, using the methyl, radical, uh, methyl alkyl halide or primary alkyl halide for best results. Okay, secondary just lowers your yield and the reaction slower. But let's say we've got this triphenylphosphine, uh, sorry, this Vidig salt right here um, with a ketone, right? And then you react those two together, you're going to get that desired methylene uh, cyclohexane compound, right? And so um, this is amazing because we're only getting that. Now, of course, um, if it's got multiple pi bonds in there, it's going to get weird. It's not... Uh, you will get a mixture of your like cis and trans or E and Z compounds. So it's not selective in that sense. You just, your region where you're going to get that pi bond is going to be guaranteed. Okay. So that's pretty much it. Uh, check out the lab. You guys are in for a treat. I was struggling, but it's all good. We had fun. I had fun. I'm just check it out. <laughs> All right, so in order to keep uh, as much of the water in the atmosphere or in the, on the glassware out of our reaction, we have to, um, we could put it in the oven, which I did actually put some of this glassware in the oven, but it was just, I was being a little impatient. I figured I might as well hit it with some fire, just like my lab coat. So you can see my lab coat didn't light on fire or anything. That was a little sediment on the lab coat that formed, but the blue lab coat that I have is actually flame retardant. And I'm wearing this because I'm gonna be working with elemental sodium, which is very pyrophoric. Uh, elemental sodium can react with water violently, uh, forms H2 gas, which kind of, uh, as we know, is also flammable. And so um, I'm wearing this as a precaution. But the reason why I'm uh, hitting all this glassware with the heat is to get rid of any water that might be on it. And the reason why we wanna do that, again, is just to get rid of the water so that it doesn't react with our sodium methoxide, okay? Because our sodium methoxide can easily get protonated. If it gets protonated, then we don't have it available to um, react with, our, with the reagents we want. So <clears throat> that's just, that's all I'm doing. Typically in, let's say a research lab, what you would do is you could put most of this glassware in the oven, if you're, um, I guess if you you got to plan ahead. That's just, I mean, we're, we're grownups now, right? You got to plan ahead. So when it comes to this type of stuff, I would put this in either the day before because I'm planning a reaction tomorrow. Um, and then you can also assemble the glassware. And then I, even after that, assemble it um, once it kind of cools off from the oven. And then you can pull a vacuum on it and then hit it with a torch as well. So like if you really need to make sure that water is not present in your reaction, this is the way to do it. So obviously uh, we don't have that option for our setup. So I'm just doing what I can. And that is hitting it with the flame. You'll see there's a ton. I mean, we live by the beach, right? So we are blessed with that, but we are also, um, we got a lot of humidity going on. So there's a lot of water in the atmosphere and that can pose a problem when you are doing uh, water sensitive reactions such as this one and so um, you'll see when I cut the sodium uh, it doesn't do it, it 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 oxidizes pretty quick so so we'll see what happens how exciting but as you can see I'm literally hitting all the glassware like even the, like the little stuff that probably won't even matter uh, especially like these little dishes right here so gotta do what you gotta do though all right so <clears throat> this first part that I'm gonna do is preparing the sodium ethoxide. You actually don't get to do this in the lab and you don't ever get to see how it's done. So this is a great opportunity. One of the benefits of being online. <clears throat> so what I'm doing is I'm gonna have this 50 mil uh, Erlenmeyer flask. You can see the round uh, stir bar in there. It's still hot from uh, flame drying it. Um, and then I'm, I, what I'm gonna do is I will place this drying tube 
inside of it. I'll have a stopper right there. I don't want to put the stopper in there yet because it's still hot and I don't want it to melt. Um, and then it's going to have um, some calcium chloride in here just as a kind of a dry anhydrous calcium chloride is going to help keep it dry in there because what I'm going to do after that is add uh, 10 mils of absolute ethanol so just uh here's our ethyl alcohol 200 proof right 100 percent at least uh no water right as we learned from our last experiment and um once i add that ethanol in there i'm going to have i'm going to add some cut up pieces of elemental sodium so what you can see here is like a, a giant brick right so this is literally just a piece of sodium. And you can see it's not really like a nice shiny color like um, like typical metals, but that's because it has an oxide layer uh, it, on the outside. And so what I'm gonna have to do in order to expose the, the reactive elemental sodium is I have to cut it up. When I cut it up into, I'm gonna cut it up into uh, just a bunch of small pieces that equate to about 0.575 grams. Then I'm going to add that to the 10 mils of ethanol. I'm going to stir that up for ah, a little bit of time, right? Uh, until it dissolves, really. And then that should give us our little batch of sodium ethoxide. So I wanted to, um, what was I going to say about this guy? Yeah, elemental sodium. It's uh, pyrophoric. You can see it's got the, the flame on there, the health hazard. Um, and then... What is this guy? Yeah, the hazardous, uh, like don't let it come into contact with your hands. Um, it reacts with water very violently and it forms H2 gas. Um, so what's gonna happen when I add it to the ethanol is it's also gonna form H2 gas. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're adding it slowly, at least at a controlled rate that is safe. Uh, and of course, working in the hood I have my blue lab coat on, as you saw in the, uh, when I was flame drying, I put, this is actually sediment, but I put my flame coat over the flame just to show you that it's a flame retardant coat. Whoa, flame retardant coat. And so this is extra precaution that I'm taking when I'm working with extra pyrophoric things. Uh, like I said, you guys don't get to play with sodium, I thought, uh, elemental sodium. Um, and so, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get that process started. <clears throat> oh, and I forgot to mention, so the the sodium is in, um, it should be in oil, does it say on here? Oh, it's in, uh, it's in kerosene. But generally what we're gonna do when we cut up our pieces or whenever we uh, kind of make it nice and clean, we're gonna dip it into xylenes and then we're gonna wipe that off before we add it to our um, sodium, or I'm sorry, our ethanol. All right, so here we go. I'm about to cut up some elemental sodium here. Um, so basically just cutting that oxidized layer off of the outside. Um, and yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? You can actually use scissors to cut this guy up. And um, not too bad. These scissors are absolute garbage though. And so, um, you just gotta be careful when you're working with it and generally want to move quickly. And also when you're working with these things with uh, elemental metals and stuff that are really pyrophoric, you should, um, be aware that some of that stuff could stick to the scissors or the, the forceps that you're working with as well. So. All right, so right now what I'm doing is I'm cutting the oxidized layer off and then I'm cutting, I'm putting those nice pieces inside of the little dish with xylenes in it. So the xylenes are uh, a hydrocarbon. They're actually aromatic um, compound. And so they have, oh, check this out. Did you see that? I'm trying to show you how like, right when I cut it off, it's still not even that shiny right for very long. It's because it's getting oxidized so quickly in this humid environment um, that uh, that might pose a problem. It might just kind of be more of a hassle in the end, but um, we'll deal with it. 
So I'm going to put 10 mils inside of here. Then I'm going to hit with the sodium chloride on that drying tube, right? And then I'm going to throw my elemental sodium inside of there to dry up that ethanol, okay? But back to the xylenes. So xylenes are benzene ring with um, two methyl groups on it. So it's like toluene, but there's two on there. And you can have ortho, meta, or paraxylenes. So if it's just if, paraxylene, if you have xylenes, then it's probably just a mixture of them, okay? And it's a hydrocarbon. It's not um, miscible with water, and so it's hydrophobic, and there's generally not much water in it. And so what's going to happen is when we add or when we place our sodium inside of that water from the atmosphere can't really touch it because it's sitting in, in like this little barrier right but it's easily wiped off um and it's harmless when it comes to our re reaction so that's why we're comfortable using it so what i'm doing here is i'm cutting the sodium directly into the ethanol because I don't, I want to minimize the amount of time that the ethanol, or I'm sorry, the amount of time that the sodium is exposed to the air, right? Because there's so much water in this humid air that it just oxidizes the outside. And if it oxidizes the outside, it creates almost like a protective layer. Ooh, check out them bubbles. There you go. It's doing its job. But it, if it oxidizes the outside, it just takes longer to react with the ethanol. And I ain't nobody got time to wait around for this, so... We cut it into smaller pieces that can react more quickly with the ethanol, okay? And so uh, it's kind of boiling or bubbling at a good rate now, and so I don't want to um, put too much in there at the same time because it is an exothermic process, and if you have a highly exothermic process in the presence of hydrogen, as we know, hydrogen is flammable, and so we could spark a fire, and I don't want to do that, right? So... Uh, yeah, there's actually, maybe I'll send you guys a video. There's a video of uh, if you put like just potassium or sodium inside of water uh, in a hood, it'll start to bubble and fizz. And if you put too much, it heats up too much. The hydrogen gas kind of pops and explodes a little bit and the, the beaker could explode as well. So that's why I'm lowering the hood just for safety, right? I know... I mean, RIP the phone if it does end up blowing up, but that's all good. I got Apple, uh, Apple Care. <laughs> so I wonder if they cover that. Um, so <clears throat> basically, what I'm going to be doing here is just keeping an eye on the rate of the formation of those bubbles. Just to, for me personally, I know what's a, too fast and what's too slow. It just takes experience. That's why you guys aren't really allowed to do this. You need to get some more experience and so the first time i ever really messed with a, a significant amount of elemental sodium was in grad school so but um yeah so the goal is to really see if we can get all of that sodium to dissolve um and then that's when we know we kind of have all of our um sodium ethoxide the, at least enough formed for our reaction what i might end up doing if it takes too long is um, just if we have a little bit of sodium floating around, that's actually not too bad. I'm down for that because that means that it's either it didn't react, uh, and it's still reacting or it's just kind of chill in there and any water that's trying to get in there will just react with it quickly. And so I'm thinking of it as like a, uh, almost like a protection layer. You know what I mean? So there we go. So I was getting ready to add some element, some more sodium, um, and then I realized I actually, actually added a little bit too much. Um, mass is not important, but I added too much elemental sodium, and um, yeah, so it might be an issue in terms of dissolving or whatever. All right, so basically just wanted to show you here. Uh, it's getting cloudy, a little thick. Um, show you the rate of formation of those bubbles is actually really slow so I think we're just going to kind of cruise on through alright so I used uh, 0 0.48 grams 0 0.480 grams 
of benzyl triphenylphosphonium chloride. Check out that skull right there. What's up? Mix that with two mils of ethanol inside of this here dry. Remember I uh, flame dried it. <clears throat> uh, conical vial and there is a uh, spin vein in there which you really can't see because it's covered but i put it next to this guy while he kind of figures out his life because the as you can oh, focus let's get the you can still see that it's working unfortunately it'll get done eventually all right so i'm gonna go ahead and add zero uh 0.75 milliliters of Ethan, uh, my sodium ethoxide. And I'm going to keep it stirring while I add it. Oop, I meant to add it slower than that. Slow, low and slow. I also want to add it like kind of quick just so that I don't let so much air and moisture from the atmosphere get in here. You saw that it turned color initially so we actually want that yellow color to persist. Okay and uh, that's an indication that the illid forms. Okay so I'm gonna let that stir for about 15 minutes. Okay all right so I actually went ahead and started another batch. Um, I'm not necessarily gonna work this up, uh, but there is a point where we can kind of tell if the desired product is forming. And so that's probably when I'll stop bringing both reactions forward. I just wasn't too stoked about the uh, fact, so the color change on this one, it was like really yellow and then it went away because I was adding so slowly and I feel like it's just really humid in here and it's just causing the sodium ethoxide to be quenched by the water in the atmosphere and so that will pose an issue and we do not want that so uh we got two batches going i might i'm not giving you both numbers though but the sorry the way out is 0 0.48 grams of that plus 0.75 mils of the sodium ethoxide and two mils of regular ethanol Hey, check out that color difference. All right, so what I'm doing here is, so this color might be because it kind of touched the the red, the septum, because it's obviously a smaller vial. It's the three mils of the five, but I had to work with what I had. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm supposed to put it on ice, but I don't have ice, so I'm going to put it in the freezer for a little bit. Hopefully there's some solid material in there and we'll, we'll check it out and we'll filter it later. Meanwhile, I got another one going. <laughs> All right, so I'm not sure if I ever did get to say it because things have been a little crazy in here, but I added 0 0.15 mils of cinnamaldehyde. This guy right here to the stirring illid. Um, it was 0.15 mils of that mixed with a little bit of ethanol. That's why I know I mentioned that the volume of this was like hella high and that's why because uh, I ended up having, added, having to add more ethanol. Um, I did add it a little bit more concentrated to this one. Um, that's why maybe part, uh, maybe also part of the reason why the color is that way. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, sorry, cinnamaldehyde of course is reacting with the illid. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter this stuff and then I'm going to wash with a little bit of cold ethanol. I put this guy in the freezer and um, that, yeah, so I guess I'll narrate what I'm doing as I'm doing it. So um, do this. putting a little bit of ethanol in here so that way I don't really contaminate the, the bulk material. Oh. All right, so I have two fil uh, filter flasks for the two different reactions. Turn this bad boy on. Oh my goodness. 
silly me. Silly, silly me. I'm out here just doing silly stuff. As you can see, it's dark outside. I'm about to get kicked off campus. I gotta hurry up. You know. Um, I'm not gonna be able to finish the lab today. <laughs> so that's unfortunate, but that's cool, that's cool. Uh, a little bit of ethanol to moisten that. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get this little swirly swirl, pour it off. See some solid material in here for sure. So that's awesome. Um, look at this. So you can see a little solid and obviously in the little um, conical vial, but then in there as well. So we're good to go. The stuff down here, this is actually going to contain um, the other isomer, and um, we might want to analyze that via TLC. So I'm going to save that. Unfortunately, it does react with the light, and it will um, isomerize from the cis trans isomer to the trans trans isomer, and it won't, uh, it might not survive overnight, which I'm going to end up having to do. So, um, it is what it is though, right? Gotta do what you gotta do. So, um, this is, we're adding two one milliliter portions of the ethanol to rinse this out, okay? That's why the ethanol had to be cold because we wanna reduce the solubility, right? Um, give a little spatula action, pour that over there. So that was one rinse. Hit it with one more. Bada bing, bada boom. Ooh, ooh. All right. So that's also rinsing the uh, the wash, right? Or the that stuff, uh, the solid material. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna take this off though. This guy's gonna just hang out in the drawer overnight. Turn that bad boy off. We gotta get it out of the light as quickly as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. You're not gonna see that, but just know that I'm placing it inside of a drawer. I'm gonna go ahead and put parafilm on that before I leave. That way it doesn't evaporate because otherwise I'll just have to add more solvent to it in the morning. And I don't want to do that. I don't wanna waste materials, but I also just don't wanna introduce more stuff. Got that going. Let's get this bad boy. Ooh, we got so much. Killing it, even even with that great or like that orange drink going too. It looks great. Swollen material. Solid. But uh, also got to remember that the uh, the filtrate, the stuff down here in the filter flask is going to have a little bit of triphenyl phosphine oxide, which is uh, the toxicity of our city. It's got a little some something, something going on that we don't really want to breathe in uh, or breathe out. Breathe in. No, so, um, sorry. I'm also like deprived of uh, water sleep. You know how I get, I get weird when I'm like hungry and tired and it's like, it's really late. <laughs> I'm like, legit about to get a parking ticket because I'm not supposed to be here past 11. But, so that's it. I filtered it, I uh, rinsed it. I'm gonna go ahead and let that sit in the in the drawer and then uh, we'll see ya. I wanna see ya. What's up? Okay, so um, I have the solid material with the filtrate in that filter flask. Uh, what we're gonna do is, there's a little bit of sodium chloride. Let's see. Yeah, we use sodium ethoxide, right? And we had the benzyl chloride. Benzyl chloride. So um, 
there's sodium chloride salt left in that solid material. So what we're gonna do is throw that back on the vacuum, uh, filter it with a little, or we're gonna, it's still on the Buchner funnel, so we're gonna wash that with a little bit of water uh, to get rid of the salt. Uh, I'll do three one milliliter portions on each of those solid materials. Um, and then what I'm going to do is let that dry for 10 minutes, on the, yeah, five minutes on the vacuum. I might even throw it in the oven for a hot second just to uh, get it extra dry. But really what we wanna do um, is take some of that sample, run a TLC, um, and then also run a melting point. So I might just leave it on the vacuum the whole time we're doing the, the TLC and stuff. So uh, we're running a TLC. I might as well just run it up the two solids that have, we, we got. And then also the uh, the filtrate, right? So we well, have two filtrates too. I already made. I gotta fix it, but I made a uh, TLC plate, right? So I didn't have a pencil because, like, who has pencils, right? Um, we're all about that that pen game and digital pencils. So I had one of these though, and I used that as my pencil. So that's cool. It works. Um, but you can see that I marked the line, this, like where we spot it, as well as uh, like three spots. I'll just change it to a fourth one. Add a fourth one in there. We wanna get some good spacing though, so that way they don't kind of morph together. Uh, but what we wanna see in that TLC is, uh, we'll see triphenylphosphine oxide because that's got triphenyl, so that means it's got three benzene rings, so it's definitely UV active and we're gonna be using this to see those spots. And so we'll see the triphenylphosphine oxide as well as hopefully the cis-trans isomers um, <clears throat> for our product. So the cis-trans and the trans-trans product. Um, and then we, yeah, I don't know if we're gonna see that because that, this filtrate was kind of sitting in the drawer overnight. Uh, it does react to light, so it is at least dark. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens. I think, um, oh, I did, I did want to show you. So we're using a uh, hexane as our eluent, right? Harmful, blah, blah, blah. I already prepared the chamber. You've seen this chamber before. It's got some filter paper in there, increased surface area for the, the hexane uh, eluent. And I already put that hexane in there. It is capped right now. Um, it was, I prepared that inside of the hood, okay? Because, uh, look at all those, what? Harmful and stuff, I like my lungs. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and do the, do the thing. Thing, thing, tickety, thing, the bang. Um, uh, thought I had a filter flask for y'all. Let's go ahead, connect it here. Bada bing, bada boom. You can't see that. All right, let me move this closer for you guys. Ooh. What's up? Check that out. I actually remembered my tripod today. What's up? It's pretty neat, huh? So, what we're doing now is we gotta get that, that, that. Boom, boom, boom. All right, found my little uh, adapter here. I'm also getting this um, this Bunsen burner because I want to make my, I told you a long time ago, or last week probably, that we could do, uh, we could make capillary tubes by melting these these guys and then stretching them out. So I just wanted to show you that. Uh, the capillary tube is going to be used for spotting our samples. So uh, that's really what you do in the lab. So. You already saw it, but I'm gonna do it and then use it. So, cool stuff, right? Uh, where's our sample? Boom. So this is the poopy brown sample. So I'll go ahead and turn that vacuum on. You saw it kind of suck up onto it. Hit it with a little bit of, maybe like one, two, and three little squirts. 
looks like a good amount of solid still present. You should might be able to see that. Yeah, maybe not, maybe. But I'm gonna go ahead and do another one. Okay, so I'm gonna put this one, let's take this off. I don't know why, it's not really necessary. I think you get the idea, but I'm showing you anyway. I'm gonna put this guy on another vacuum line. Well, this guy, bring this new one in here. Show ya. Get that sample out. So this is the like prettier looking one, like the better looking one but we never know just because of a little bit of color on the that weird uh, orange uh, like orange drink looking one um, it could still be really clean minor impurities can add quite a bit of color and so we don't want to be discouraged by the by the simple fact that there's color in there so i'm gonna go ahead and leave that on there for a little bit while i re-prep or like basically just add my fourth spot on here. I'm gonna spot the two uh, filtrates on here and then I'll gather a little sample of these guys um, and place them inside of this adorable little uh, 10 milliliter beaker. I'm gonna do one in here and then an the other sample in another beaker. We're gonna go ahead and add a little drippity drop of acetone so watch your nails if you just got them did um, but yeah that's gonna dissolve our sample we're gonna go ahead and spot them on a TLC plate throw them in the chamber this gorgy chamber right here and then see what happens we'll analyze but uh, let's see what do we want to do first y'all why don't we come back in a second we got this here um, what do you call it a pipette yeah, I didn't have my uh, my coffee this morning. What is that? Like, who does that? You just wake up and then you like go about your day without coffee. For real. Got my gorgy flame right here. You see that blue, that blue cone zone? All right, so you wanna be all up in that cone zone and spin it, 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 Wait till you can, like right now I can't bend it, okay? I'm like trying, uh, obviously you don't wanna break that part, but uh, it should bend very easily when it starts to melt. And so when it starts to melt, see, look at that, Oof. Okay, now I can still keep spinning because it's not quite melted enough. And then when I, it's getting a little easier, blah, blah, blah. Still spinning, still spinning, still spinning. And then I'm gonna start pulling it apart and then lift up. And you can see a really thin area, right? So that thin area is really what we can use for our capillary tube. Let's see if it breaks in a good area. Cause, well, I made another one a second ago, but um, it's too thick. You can actually see how thick that is. And uh, it was a bad camera angle, so I didn't show you guys, but um, what I can do is just do it in, in the center part again after it has cooled off. And so we'll see if that works. Because you never know how many spotters you're going to need, or maybe you can make some for your friends, or maybe you're just like in the mood to melt glass, so you can make a bunch right now and save them for later. Um, so we're going. Also, I kind of, look how fun this is. Actually, I'm just gonna melt and then twist. Melt and twist. Bend and snap. Like, isn't that fun? Look at that. I mean, can you imagine how much fun I'm having right now? Like, you can't, you can't even imagine right now. Are you serious right now? Like, for real? It's so much better. What you can actually do is pull a vacuum on it and then, and then it pulls, we should do that, y'all. We should do that. Pause. Okay, so it's not totally related to the lab, but it's fun. And I just wanna show you 
Um, so we can go ahead and seal this end off. I'm pulling a vacuum on this. It's not a great vacuum because this doesn't like perfectly connect. But once you like seal off the end, so well, let me just do this tip right here. Okay, so that's I don't hear the noise anymore. So it's 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 a uh, sealed off, right? Once you start hitting the middle part, though, since it's pulling a vacuum, it starts to get sucked in instead of just like normal melting. Let's see if it works because the vacuum, like I said, is not amazing on it. Haha. <laughs> All right, hold on. I don't want to touch it yet. It's hot. But. You can see that it got sucked in and then uh, it looks cool <laughs> uh, that's it okay anyway we've got our spotters now <clears throat> this is really important information just so you guys know right so um, hold on that's my kids knocking at the door they're like daddy hurry up okay I'm back um, now it's time I, what I did was I, I did scrape a little something some inside of these little uh, this beaker and this flask um, beaker flask and so the I did the flask is the weird colored one the orange drank and then the beaker is like the normal like yellow looking one um, and so of course we need to add a couple dribbity drops of acetone to dissolve it just enough to dissolve that and it won't take much um, and then it does dissolve or it does uh, evaporate quickly so maybe I'll add like a little extra drop in there okay so now what we've got is let's see if we can do this nope 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 oh, you can't see that and I'm gonna uh, struggling. where's that this guy right here I don't know if this is gonna, gonna be a good camera angle or not what if I'll go ahead and spot this guy on the right so I'm placing this in here you won't be able to see the liquid in here but you just dab 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 it's not working let's try the other side you don't want remember when you spot this you don't want to hold it down you want to like tap because the, um, the liquid spreads out it like it's like a weird uh, it looks kind of cool so the water starts at the center the liquid starts at the center and then it expands like that and you don't want that to happen okay so you don't want it to get too big is what I mean sorry and then let's try this guy for the other one I like, for me, I am kind of like systematic and weird. Uh, I like to count how many spots I do. So I did probably like 10 on that one, um, just to, so I know like, okay, I did 10. And then if I determine that it's not very concentrated, then I can say like, okay, we'll do 10 more. Or if it was decently concentrated, but I still need a little more, I'll do five more. And then that's, I, that's just how I work, but. So that's a, I think that's a suggestion to kind of keep things organized and maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe it'll work for you, maybe it won't. So you can see, uh, let's see, where are you at? Um, oh, there you go. Ooh, see how that's glowing? That means we spotted our sample, right? So acetone does, alone does not do that. So that is our sample. Ah, it's a little big, but it's cool. Um, we do around yeah we're gonna get going we're doing what we do so all right now we gotta spot the uh filtrate thing i'm not sure if i'll be able to reach it we shall see so the good sample was on the left side so i'm gonna go ahead and put this this is the filtrate for the good sample. 
on the left side of the dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, probably. Just because that seems kind of gray, and dark, and very concentrated. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure this is going to work. Let's go with this guy right here in order to get inside of this flask. I could have poured it into something else, but like, why? And then I gotta clean more glassware. Ooh, that's gonna be too much. And bloop, bloop. Oh, did you see that expand? You probably did, even though it's so far away. Like, that's bad. It's about to be uh, hella street. Okay, so you can see all the colors show up, right? What's interesting is that that's the short wave UV, and then this is the long wave. Oh, that was kind of cool. It just came off late, come on late. But the notice the two filtrate samples don't don't really glow. Like so, that's off. So that any color you see is associated with the just the filtrate itself in the visible spectrum. This is on in the long wave. These two samples do glow, but the filtrate doesn't but then in the long wave or sorry short wave they all glow it's just different um wavelengths or whatever so no big deal we're gonna go ahead and place this in here make sure hopefully our volume is good we'll go ahead and place that in here and we're off to the races I'm gonna go ahead and cap that. Um, and it's running. It's super, super sonic. So of course, while that is running, what we wanna do is, uh, sorry, that, that TLC, right? Uh, what we wanna do is set up our uh, boiling point. <laughs> so do that. Bye. All right, so I did get my boiling point tube set up, but I also had to stop this. So let's do a uh, long wave first. This is, how did I do this before? goodness you can see so the two on the the oh it's kind of reversed I think really uh, this side right here represents the products and then the other side where you see the blue glowing that is the um, <clears throat> the filtrate I'm sorry and then let's go ahead and switch the to shortwave. You can definitely see them a lot better. You can see also, I'll take a picture of this and it'll look way better, but I just wanted to show you. Um, so we, we've got a lot of spots. So the, the on this side right here on the bottom, that is the products. So the first two are the products. The one on the bottom bottom is the poopy poopy one. The one above it is the like perceivably good one. They roughly have the, a similar uh, RF value. Unfortunately, it looked like when it started, the liquid started to go up, it looked like it was a little slanted for whatever reason. And so perhaps that's why you have that slant in the samples, right? So because every spot, so like these ones right here, the lower RF value, those should be equal. And then you have the other two that should probably be around the same as these bottom. So all the bottom ones right here in the midpoint should be the same-ish. And then the top ones should be their own as well. So this, let me uh, adjust the angle, okay? Okay, sorry, that's a much better angle. Um, and now what I can do is point with stuff. So this guy right here so this is the filtrate 
that was ye it was yellow. The filtrate that was orange. The product that was yellow, and then the product that was orange, or not the product. Sorry, the 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 solution was orange, right? So the products for these two were equivalent. They were both like a white crystalline material. Um, what we see here is a little bit of streaking. It's it's probably just where I spotted the sample before it starts separating. So this right here and this right here should be triphenylphosphine oxide. Notice it's not present in the products because it washed away and is in the filtrate only. Okay, and now these blue, looks cool, right? Uh, that is the trans-trans product and then the top one is the cis-trans product. Uh, all the way up here, I made a line right there because I didn't have the pencil. I just scraped off some of that uh, silica that's the solvent front that's how far high the solvent went so when you're trying to determine the uh, RF value for these things let's go ahead and use the bottom one so like this one right here and that one right there and then that one right there because those are actually equal right so um, those are the RF values for that particular trans-trans product, and then that's for the cis-trans product, and then the triphenylphosphine oxide will be this bottom one as well, okay? Um, again, when I placed it in there, for whatever reason, the solvent started coming up at a little angle like that, and it continued, because once it got wet, it, it went at the same rate consistently, so that's why everything traveled at that at that pace and it all pretty much traveled the same distance but it started at different times because it let me see where it is right here so the what solvent got on here and then it immediately was like curved so that means that these middle ones started running up the TLC plate sooner and that's why it's curved um, but in any case we're going with these ones right here and then that one right there okay Ooh, look at that Anybody else super down for black lights when they were little kids or like still I used to write on my wall with highlighters yeah um, that's it let's check out that boiling point all right so started at 1 30 holy moly um, geez. and then I got my two samples in here the one on the left is the yellow one the one on the right is the orange one um, the orange reaction, I should say. And so it's pretty flaky. It was hard to get in the melting, melting point tube, but it's all good. I, I, I keep saying boiling point, don't I? Whoa, sorry, I meant melting point. So melting point tube, melting point of the solid. Hopefully you got that. All right. Uh, I'm not gonna run through this video the whole time. I'm just gonna kinda, maybe I'll show you at the end. Uh, maybe I'll just give you the numbers. Okay, so for the yield, looks like a lot, right? Uh, really only weighed out to be, looks pretty too, look at that, woo! Really only weighed out to be uh, 13 milligrams. This guy right here, even less. So that first sample, this one right here, that's 13 milligrams of the, the yellow reaction. This is three milligrams of the orange reaction. And uh, yeah, so I did take some for the TLC, for the for the melting point. Um, and so, yeah, and then obviously you can see, the struggle was a little real. I didn't get any, uh, or I didn't get all of it on there to weigh it, but that's cool, stuff happens. All right, I wasn't able to get the video of the boiling point. So before I forget that, because you know how I do, it was 140. Let me look at this real quick. Sorry. <laughs> uh, wrote it down, of course. You always got to write in your lab notebook. Um, it was 145 to 148. Okay, so it was it was pretty quick. And it was like 145.1 to 148.2. One, so I didn't, I just rounded down, so whatever. Um, but here's the picture of the TLC. So, this is unfortunately the way that you're gonna have to calculate your, your RF values. So, remember, I said use that le far left lane and pretty much the one on the right, but it's the same as the left, uh, at least for the, the, the 
the proper isomers. So measure, remember the center of the, the circle to, and then um, the solvent line. Hopefully you can see that at the top of the page or the screen. It's right where the little broken silica is kind of like cut off or whatever. But um, and then the, the starting point at the very bottom you can see as well. Um, if you have any questions on this, please let me know because I understand this like it's not ideal to get a picture. But really, all you have to do is just pause the video, throw a little ruler on there real quick on the screen, and then it doesn't have to be uh, like it doesn't have to be in centimeters or whatever inches. It just needs to be the same units for each measurement that you make. So it could technically be like how many uh fingernails uh, in length is this whole this spot and the next spot and the solvent front right just as long as it's the same unit and you have the proper number of each of them right so obviously use something better than a fingernail but sometimes you got to do what you got to do don't they measure horses with hands right 14 hands um never mind um Anyway, so there's that, your TLC. Of course, you got to talk about that TLC because you got to talk about how quality it is, right? Um, and how gorgeous it looks and uh, what's going on with it as well, right? Um, but then in addition to discussing your TLC, of course, you got to talk about the melting point and um, maybe you got to look up that literature value as well. Um, maybe you can take a look at the literature value of the cis trans isomer. If you can find it, that would make for a great comment on the, that book report or <laughs> book report. Dang, what am I doing? Um, that, uh, lab report. Uh, and then of course, like, I mean, there were error errors for days. So you got plenty to talk about like that. So don't be, don't be shy. Make sure you're very specific about those. Otherwise you're going to get marked off because there's plenty to talk about there. So, uh, hopefully um, I don't know. Hopefully you got something from this lab. It was fun. Um, you can hear my kids pounding on the door in the background. Cause like I said, at the beginning, this lab was a struggle. It took me, um, a lot longer to do than it would take in, it would have taken you guys. Cause I had to do some extra stuff, but also filming is weird. And so I was there the night before as well, uh, as well as that morning. And, uh, yeah, you know, when you got, when you got kids, you plan to get things done as quickly as possible. And when you got to go back the next morning, they come in with you. But they were, uh, it's all good. They were outside playing with my dog and my wife. So they weren't there by themselves. Um, <laughs> but they were done. They're ready to go home. So let's go home. You're probably at home already, but let's uh, let's let's stop and take a break. Let's do this live report in a minute. Okay, hopefully we can get notes. Bye.